All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well and got through this weekend okay around the country. A lot of civil unrest, including in downtown Birmingham. But we're continuing our series of discussions with individuals in different parts of society talking about how the pandemic is affecting, really has impacted almost all areas of society. And I'm so pleased that our discussion today is with Heather Newsom Leonard, an attorney here in Birmingham and friend of mine. And we're going to talk about how employment issues, or excuse me, what employment issues there are to consider during the pandemic. Now, we'll preface this. We can't do this in 30 minutes and be comprehensive. We're just going to hit the surface and the most important things that there are to consider because there's just so many things between unemployment, FMLA, the CARES Act, um, OSHA's new regulations. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but that's why we've got Heather here with us. So welcome, Heather. Thank you for having some time for us today. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me here. That This is one of those, unfortunately, hot topics that we're all having to get a crash course on pretty quickly, um, that it's created entirely new questions about, can my employer do this? And you've got the flip sides on both. You've got some employers who are restricting employees from coming back to work mm -hmm. and employees are trying to get back. And then you've got other employers who um, are demanding employees come back and employees are having concerns about distancing. So you've got, you know, questions on both sides of the issue. And then, you know, we're all lawyers and we likely have staff. So we have our own personal questions about what can we do and um, what, how should we be treating our employees and what protocols exist to help with that? Gosh, there's so, there's so many things to unpack here. But before we really dive into this, Heather, tell us a little bit about your practice for the folks who may not know of you. All right, well, I am a labor and employment lawyer. Um, my practice is 100% employment law. If, if I wind up veering off into personal injury or anything like that, I'm lost. I don't know how I got there. I don't know what happened. Um, you know, Somebody touches you the wrong way outside of work, I don't know what to do with that. You get touched at work improperly, I'm your girl to help you out. That um, my practice is 100% issues dealing with employment law questions. Um, and I mainly represent employees. Every now and then I may have a small business that I represent, but almost exclusively am I there on the side of a plaintiff. And it can be anything from discrimination to non-compete agreements, to non-disclosure agreements, um, to terminations, anything like that. If it, if it deals with employment, with the exception of workers' comp, there are smarter people to deal with that than me. I can't even spell that. Is it workman's comp, workmen's comp? I don't know. Don't know how to spell it. Don't even go there. That's not me. Well, we will, we'll, we'll stay clear of any work comp issues. In fact, as, as you know and others know, that's what my brother David and I handle quite a bit of. We've got a blog that is coming out hopefully this hour or two. My coworker just coughed on me. Can I sue my employer? Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll touch on that. But where I want to start, Heather, is in general, what, what I know and what maybe the public knows a little bit about is Alabama being an at-will employment state. What, what does that term mean so people can get a baseline understanding? Think of it as a friendship. At will means you, your employment can be ended at any time by your decision or by your employer's decision. It's a voluntary relationship. So at any time your employer, absent a contract or some type of explicit promise, which gets off into its own little world, but generally it means your employer can change your hours can change your position, um, can change your pay, can and can let you go for any reason, good reason, no reason, bad reason. And likewise, you can quit. You can um, end that relationship on your own as well. The exceptions to that doctrine are if there is an employment agreement or contract, because that now spells out the terms of employment rather than it being a consensual relationship that the parties have agreed to. Um, or if there is a state or a federal statute that says, I'm going to restrict this area or this decision. For example, in Alabama, um, 
there's a workers' compensation retaliation statute that says you can't fire someone because they've filed a workers' compensation claim. Um, there is a federal and a state age discrimination statute that I sum up generally as saying you can't do bad things to an employee because of their age. There are federal statutes that protect different forms of, um, or protect people from different forms of discrimination at work. Race, gender, national origin, religion, disability, military service. Um, these are some of those categories. Um, but absent there being a statute that restricts an employer's ability to make a decision using some type of protected characteristic or a contract, employment at will basically means it's, it's Lord of the Flies, it's state of nature, that it's whatever the parties um, agree to. So the practical effect for most employees is um, employers can do things that we think are wrong, that we think are immoral, but they're not necessarily illegal because under an employment at will doctrine, they can let you go. So if they give you a reason that's false, we may think that's wrong. We may think it's illegal or we may think it's immoral, but it's not illegal. And it's, uh, we have these conversations all the time that just because your supervisor is a jerk or you have a personality conflict with him or her, that doesn't necessarily rise to the levels of violating laws. Exactly. If, if I could sue an employer because the supervisor was a jerk, mm -hmm. I'd be in much grander surroundings. Than this. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, I mean, you're putting it a lot more nicely. I usually tell people it's not against the law to be a, a blank. Yeah. Um, and well, that's my, my mother may be watching in a few minutes, so I got to keep it, keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's Heather, with that in mind, with Alabama being an at will employment state, and unless you have a contract, unless you probably uh, unless you're protected by a union in some sort. Um, with society opening back up and businesses are starting to, on various levels, allow employees to come back and on some level or even interact with the public. I want to take, I want to go into the mindset of a worker who's being called back into work. They've been home now for six or eight weeks. And they've got some real concerns about what's it going to be like when I come back to work. I don't want to come back to work. I have all, you know, our, they have hundreds of things going through their head. They're talking to their, their, their family at home about these issues. What are some of the, the topics? What are some of the things that you're dealing with uh, right now on that very subject? Um, the first one doesn't get too much into the law, but it's the call we're getting a lot of right now, which is, I've been working from home. My employer is calling me back to work, but I have young children and childcare is not available. Um, you know, a lot of the overnight camps, they're gone. Um, that some The state's loosening of some restrictions has eased this somewhat, but people are still scared and jumpy about some of the options that are there. Um, and so in that circumstance, there really isn't much protection for you under the law if you find yourself there. Um, other than to just talk to your employer, that most businesses aren't sitting there going, oh, I want to do horrible things. They want to get back to work so that they can perform the service or produce the product um, that's their business. And they want their workers to come back because that's the only way their business can move forward. And so a lot of employers are going to talk to you and be flexible about what they can do because they would rather have an experienced worker that they can be a little flexible with than someone they have to go through and train, um, but can maybe be there from eight to five. So take that first. Um, the next is the most common one, which is fear. I'm scared to go back into this work environment. I can do my job just fine from home. Been doing it for you know almost three months now. Why should I have to go into this environment and be around other people and I'm taking care of my elderly mother, or I've got young children, or I'm pregnant and I don't want to expose my child to this. These are all the concerns that I have. Or I've got asthma. I um, have mild COPD. Um, I'm going through a chemotherapy treatment, so my immune system is compromised. You know, there are all these conditions that may put you at risk. Uh, under those circumstances, the Americans with Disabilities Act provides some guidance. 
that if you have a health condition that may put you at risk, but your employer is saying, you need to come back, um, you can request the accommodation of continuing to work from home. The ADA anticipates a dialogue or what it calls an interactive process between the employer and the employee, where the employee basically says, I can do my job. This is what it takes for me to do my job. You know? And the employer then evaluates, can they do that? Is it reasonable? And if it doesn't impose an undue burden on the employer, then they should grant that. Now, if your job is something that requires you to be in person and they've you know, crossed their fingers in hopes that you could work from home, um, if the employer can show it creates an undue burden, like you're a receptionist at um, your job is to be at the front desk. So you've been fielding calls from home while the office has been closed, but now they want you to come back and you're like, well, can I just still do this? If part of your job is being at that front desk and greeting people as they come into the office, it may not be reasonable for them to leave you at home because you're not doing part of the job and that would create an undue burden on them because they have to hire someone else. Um, so that's really the first thing is, again, the theme here is going to be talking to your employer. Um, and if the employer can't work with you, then that's when you reach out to someone like me and say, okay, this is what's going on. Can they really do this? Um, the other thing is, you know, understanding that some of the privacy that we felt we had, we may not have in the workplace anymore. Um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, it's generally been understood that employers couldn't ask you certain health related questions. Um, well, now the EEOC has issued guidance that makes it clear um, employee, employers can ask employees who um, report feeling ill, they can ask them about those symptoms to see if they may be COVID-19 related. They can measure your body temperature, you know, doing the temperature checks, um, that they can send somebody home if they're exhibiting COVID-19 symptoms because you don't want to infect the rest of the office. Um, they can make disability-related inquiries or require medical exams if you're not symptomatic um, to if you're in a high risk group to determine if there's a problem. And so these are things that some people may have an initial reaction to going, ooh, that's too far. Yeah, we're, but in, it's something we're that in a whole appears. different world right now. But we really are. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that is scary, but the EEOC has said, look, you know, telecommuting is a, is a reasonable request to make. And so if you're in a high risk group, if you've got these symptoms, at, make that request. If the employer says no, then there may be a claim for a failure to accommodate. And this is me as the employment lawyer jumping in. If that happens, you need to act quickly. Most of us in law school kind of get used to the idea of a two-year statute of limitations for most claims that are out there or most wrongs or torts. Employment law is a little different. Almost all employment claims require you to do something within six months of the bad act. Um, for claims under the Americans with Disabilities Act, if you want to pursue the claim, you're going to need to file a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And you have to do that within 180 days of the last date of discrimination. Um, so this is something that if your employer denies you that accommodation, you need to get up with a lawyer quickly, because um, some employers may not realize, hey, they're required to do this, that they're required to have this dialogue. And if they won't talk to you about it, if they won't explore it, um, then that can be a violation of the ADA. That there are a lot of cases where courts have found that law has been violated because the employer just wouldn't sit down and have that discussion about, can we make this work? Heather, what about those situations, the employment situations, where it's a small company that may or may not come under the requirements or regulations of the ADA or other federal civil laws or, or rights? There may be some other statutes that come into play um, for the Americans with Disabilities Act to enter into the picture. They have to have 15 or more employees for 20 calendar weeks out of the year. Part-time employees count, but owners don't. So if you've got a family-owned business that's owned among three people, those three owners don't count in the, the numbers. Um, but let's say you work in an eight-person office. That's not going to fall under the ADA. The National Labor Relations Act may protect you 
under the National Labor Relations Act. And that's what most people think of as the Unions Act. It's, you know, it's out there to protect your ability to get together as a union. Well, inherent in that statute is a protection for what's called concerted protected activity. That's a big fancy legal term for more or less saying you've made a complaint that is about an issue that affects more than you, that affects the workforce. Um, concerted protected activity is your ability to speak out on behalf of the workforce. So if you have a complaint, um, I think our working conditions aren't safe because you've got eight people in a 12 by 12 room we can't effectively socially distance. We can't wear PPE because of what we do, those sorts of things. That type of complaint is protected. And if your employer winds up letting you go because of that complaint, then you may have the ability to file something with the National Labor Relations Board. Um, and that's, again, you need to do it within 180 days. But the National Labor Relations Board can pursue a claim to see if you have been the victim of retaliation for raising that complaint. Um, and that's a very strong protection or can be as long as you act within the guidelines and within the time frame. It is. And it's one of those things that we forget about a lot. Um, and it's a fantastic resource that the NLRB, um, their office is over in Ridge Park Place over on South Side, but you can file a complaint online. And the NLRB is very aggressive, um, that their investigators are attorneys. And if they find a violation, those attorneys turn into the ones that prosecute the claim. And a lot of times when P employees call you and something just smells wrong, um, they don't have to have a lawyer to file a complaint. Um, you know, obviously help having a lawyer will make them feel more secure. Um, and depending on other moving parts of what's going on, the lawyer may need to be involved. But it's something that they can call the NLRB and make that complaint themselves. And it's, it's a very effective mechanism for addressing those situations. Mm -hmm. Good information, guys. If you're just joining us, I'm talking with Birmingham attorney Heather Newsom Leonard. We're talking about a whole host of employment issues that you need to consider or at least be know, know a little bit about. Uh, how these laws work, and we're talking about at-will employment, we're talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act, the National Labor Relations Board, which there's so many things here. Heather, I kind of want to pivot for a minute or two and talk about unemployment. The laws in Alabama, and probably every state, have changed to be more permissive. They've allowed, gosh, probably record numbers of Americans, and particularly Alabamians, to file as well. And there's an interaction here between being furloughed versus, there's a difference between being furloughed uh, versus being terminated or, or let go completely, laid off, whatever you want to call the term. So I want to talk about the differences between being furloughed and being laid off or terminated because the business is just completely uh, shutting down. Absolutely. And one thing I am going to say, in case people are paying attention, the department, the Alabama Department of Labor is backlogged as well right now. And so a lot of what's going on are the delays. And so the first step to look at is what is the purpose of unemployment to understand these distinctions? And it's there basically as a form of insurance for employees for periods of unemployment that were unexpected or unintended. And the reason I say that is a lot of the calls we've had lately have been people who um, have been drawing unemployment because of the COVID-19 situation and are being recalled to work and are scared to go back to work or hesitant to go back to work. And um, they might be making more money at home. You see it a lot in the service industry yeah. where people yeah. are making 213 an hour plus tips. Mm -hmm. they're, they're doing better right now drawing yeah. unemployment. And that's, that's kind of one of those sticky things that if you're able to work and you turn down a job or decline employment, you refuse to go back, you become ineligible for unemployment. And that is very important because um, unemployment isn't there because I'm hesitant to work. It's there because I want to work, I'm able to work, but I can't work for whatever reason. I was either let go or these circumstances. 
Um, the other thing is if your health prevents you from working, you're not entitled to unemployment benefits because one of the things you have to show is that you're able to work. And so the Department of Labor will disqualify you for unemployment benefits if you're not able to work. In other words, if you're like, well, I was in the hospital. Yeah, well, you wouldn't have been at work during that time. So you don't get those benefits because you're not able to work. Um, but I say all of that just because there are a lot of people right now who basically feel like they're doing better on unemployment. Um, you can be, the unemployment can say, hey, you defrauded us if you do this. And they can ask you to pay that money back. And you don't want to be in that situation. Um, and they can pursue that fairly aggressively. And they can say, you know, we paid you a thousand, two thousand dollars in benefits that you shouldn't have received. Um, so employees need to be very cautious about just saying, well, I'm going to draw my unemployment rather than answering the call to go back to work. Um, and that's that's part of the the situation is um, in order for you to get unemployment benefits, if you've been laid off, you have to be able and available to work um, while receiving the benefits. And so if you're not able and available to work, you don't get those. So if you say, you know, well, I've got childcare issues, I can't come back to work, then you're not available. Um, if you say I'm at risk, so I'm nervous about going back to work, it's kind of the same thing. Um, that I, I'm pulling up some of the information that I've put together that I'd mentioned to you that I've got a handout that you can make available in the Facebook group after we talk that goes over some of these common questions. Um, and so in order to get unemployment compensation, you would have to show that you um, have been quarantined by a medical professional or um, a government agency. Um, you have been laid off or sent home without pay for an extended period of time. Um, let's see, I'm sorry that um, if you've been diagnosed with COVID-19, you might be able to get it. Um, or if you're caring for somebody with COVID-19, these are some of the exceptions from before. But if it's, I've got the flu and I'm not going back because I don't want to get exposed to COVID-19 again. Eh. Um, but again, you've got to be able and available to go back to work. Um, and there's also the, um, the CARES Act, which now outlines some additional benefits that can be administered through unemployment. But you know, for the lawyers watching, um, the best thing to do at this point is go to the Alabama Department of Labor's website. They've got a lot of really good resources there. Um, and for employees, go there first. I know it's like reading Greek um, because that's how lawyers keep their jobs. If we make things complicated, you need us to explain them to you. Um, so why say it simply? We, we make no money that way. Um, but we've been answering a lot of calls on unemployment and you know we don't charge for a 30 minute phone con consultation um, and so a lot of times we'll sit there and answer questions um, and if you feel that a mistake has been made relating to your benefits you can file an appeal again act quickly I, if i remember correctly you've got 14 days to pursue the appeal and then it would be time barred um, but again they're backlogged which doesn't really help you too much now because That's what I was gonna say. Benefits, when and then there's the appeal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it may be a month or two before you get those benefits. And at that point, you know, the, the horse is already let out of the barn, shutting the door is not going to do you any good. Well, it's, you know, a lot of times uh, what we've had to, to explain to folks is you're likely not going to get someone on the phone. You really should be, if, if, when we're dealing with Department of Labor unemployment compensation, you need to go online and go through their portal that way because that's a much more efficient and, it, and it's not terribly efficient. It's just that the phone calls, the, the likelihood of you picking up the phone and speaking to someone is very, very small just because of the sheer volume right now of people who are, are calling and, and appealing for the same exact reasons. And I mean, and if you think about it, the state is no different than every other employer that's out there. They've got people that have been, you know, working from home, they have reduced capacity. And so this is a time that I think we all are required to up our, the level of patience that, that we can exhibit and embrace. But you need to go online first, because if you do get a person, um, if you ask something that's going to be online, they're probably going to refer you back to it and end the call and move on to the next one. Um, but 
Yeah, and for what it's worth, the EEOC's website has some really good guidance. Um, and there's a national organization that I'm a member of, the National Employment Lawyers Association, or NELA, N-E-L-A. And their website, www.nela.org, so www.nela.org, has a lot of information on its front page um, for employees and resources that can help them in various states um, that I know for some reason I got a call from somebody in Florida with an unemployment question because they couldn't get anybody um, on the phone down there they're in the panhandle and I was able through the NELA site they've got a lot of lawyers that are designated to help um, with those questions and we could route them back to them but that's it's a helpful website I'm putting a clickable link in the show notes here All right. so folks, for NELA.org and Heather, there's so many other topics to, to address here, but I want to I want to ask you a couple of things. Um, if someone comes to work and they falsely respond to questions about their symptoms or being exposed to family members in their home who've either tested positive or had symptoms. What is an employer's response once they find out, let's say three days later, they find out that the receptionist in this example was exposed, was carrying on with symptoms and then got diagnosed the third day, but now they've potentially exposed the others who walk and interact with that receptionist What's the employer supposed to do at this point? Well, the first thing is the employer needs to let all of the employees know they've been exposed. Mm -hmm. um, because if not, you know, it's like, I don't mean to make light of it, but it's like what the old Breck hair commercial, they'll tell two people and they'll tell two, yeah. Right. But that's that, because you now have a larger group that's been exposed that could potentially infect the others. And that's, that's how community spread, mm -hmm. you know, takes us down. So the first thing is the employer needs to let the other employees know you've been exposed to somebody who is positive for COVID-19. Um, that, and the employer's allowed to say, look, somebody in, in our office has been positive, you've been exposed. Um, the, it's harsh, you know, the employer can send people home that it believes have been exposed and, and they should because you, you don't wanna continue the exposure, um, you know, a lot of the cases are asymptomatic, but an asymptomatic person can still infect another person and they may not be asymptomatic. Well, so the employer needs to notify the coworkers they've been exposed. Um, they need to basically quarantine, send home the people that have been exposed for the appropriate period. Um, and the dishonest employee needs to be careful. Um, there are protections that under the CARES Act and Family First Act that basically say you can't be fired because you get COVID-19, but there's a difference between firing somebody because they test positive for COVID-19 and firing somebody because they were dishonest about it. The misrepresentation may get Exactly. Up. And, and that's completely illegal. An employer is well within its rights for letting an employee go who has misled them, that has not been truthful with them, or has concealed a material fact. Um, because it's put other people at risk and it's put their business at risk. So they're, they're within their rights for letting an employee go who willfully conceals information or um, outright misleads them. Let me give you a real example from our office. We've been working since March, like everybody else, skeleton crew, paralegals in the office had previously in the last couple of years been telecommuting, if you will, working remotely. So that part of the transaction, I mean, transition was, was seamless for us. One of the paralegals wanted to come back to work uh, just for a change of scenery. And we, in the way our suite is set up, you can work in your own space, door shut, don't have to really interact with anybody. Well, she three or four days into coming back to work, she reports her husband's coworker tested positive. What do we do? Well, we talked to her about, and this is the communication part that you were referring to. We said to her, why don't you go back home for at least two weeks, see how you feel, see if you test positive or your husband, 
but just resume working from home. And that's been just fine. And it's put her mind at ease a little bit because she certainly, because we're a small firm, everybody, you know, we're kind of close yeah. here from a friendship and relationships standpoint. And you sure don't want to be the one who is brings it into the, the office. Well, exactly. And a lot of this is just using some common sense and compassion. I think the way you handled it is perfect because especially in smaller offices, all it takes is one or two people being taken out and the office goes down. Yeah. Yeah. And but I mean, and I get it because I think there are probably a lot of people who, from a financial standpoint, are like, look, I got to work. I need that paycheck. Sitting at home, I'm not getting the paycheck. So they may conceal information um, from their employer so they can get into work and start working. But if you do that in the long run, you're hurting yourself and you're hurting others because even if you're asymptomatic, if you infect the rest of the workforce, the business is going to shut down. Um, and you just don't want to do that. That right now we're learning more and more about COVID-19 every day and its symptoms and its effects. And, you know, this just isn't something to play around with now that, you know, stay home. This is the time that, you know, we kind of have to dig in and find that responsibility within ourselves and say, this may be uncomfortable. This may be hard, but I owe it to myself and I owe it to others not to do something to put anybody at risk. But and that's really what employers need to be doing is. And, and hopefully the good employers take care of their employees in that manner. They put return to work policies and procedures in place and they communicate them with all of their, their staff. Heather, how can folks get in touch with you if they have these kind of questions, concerns, or potential cases? Um, our website has a form, and that's one of the best ways to get in touch with me is to fill out that form. And our website is employmentlawal.com. Um, that form, when you fill it out, comes straight to my email. And so I see it pretty quickly. You can call and we're using a third party answering service that I learned about through some of the resources you provide. Oh, um, but you know, there, my office is a small office. There's me um, and then I've got my office manager slash husband, can't fire him, so you know, <laughs> we deal with him. And then I've got an assistant, but um, you know, there are three of us. So if we're all on the phone, your call may not be answered, but our number is 205-977-5421. Um, or you can email me. My email is on our website, um, but it's heather at employmentlawal.com or heather at heatherleonardpc.com. Um, but usually the electronic communication will get to me quickly um, and then I can get back to you as soon as possible. And I put the clickable link to your website in the show notes here for anybody who wants to start that process with, with Heather. Two last things before we wrap up. One, can your husband use the marriage contract to say that he's not an at-will employee in the in the firm? Oh, he's gone beyond that. He controls our payroll. He brings me the oh. paycheck. Oh. You know, like, what do I? Oh, all I hear is get back to work, make more money. <laughs> um, and the second thing is is to to address the title of the uh, blog that we've got come out coming out today. My coworker coughed on me. Can I sue the employer? And here's the lawyer answer. Well, it depends. Did, you, did the, What did the employer know at the time? Did they know anything? Did they not know anything? You know, there's so many other facts we need to put in there. Well, and you're absolutely right. Most employment law is more reactive than proactive, unfortunately. Yeah. You can't stop people from doing bad things. You just can't fix stupid. Um, but how the employer reacts to situations is really what defines whether the conduct mm -hmm. is legal or illegal. And we're in a completely new world in terms of where things are going that um, I know one of the employers that I've been, that I represent a client with now, the employer is trying to protect workers, or at least that's what they say. Um, so they're recalling the workforce in that's under a certain age and the workforce that's above an age is being allowed to telecommute and it's led to all sorts of brouhaha and is this discriminatory oh, yeah. and is it not and is yeah. it age discrimination? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're going round and round in that and there's not a clear answer because um, their pay remains the same, but they're being treated a little bit differently in their working conditions. Um, and so, I mean, the best thing now I think is if something 
feels wrong or if it feels off, contact a lawyer. Um, you know, the worst that can happen is you, you have a compassionate ear for a few minutes and you learn there's nothing that can be done. But communication is really the important part right now. It's just... And it is in all aspects of, of life right now and the new normal, the ever-changing new normal. Heather, thank you so much for spending some time and sharing your expertise with us today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm going to send you that fact sheet so that you can put it in the show notes. Oh, please, please do. I certainly will. And guys, as we've been doing for many weeks now on Mondays and Thursdays at 1 p.m. Central, we try to have conversations and different with people in different parts of society and how the pandemic has been impacting those areas. And we've done ranging from restaurant owners to education. Uh, we're gonna be talking later this week about how the adoption and fostering of children has been impacted and how they're dealing with it. But thank you uh, again, Heather, thank you for all who have uh, been watching us today. And this will be up on our YouTube channel this afternoon. I'll send you a copy, Heather. Thank you. Can share you. Out. And guys, just please continue to be patient. Use common sense. Do the right thing. We're going to come through with this, but it's going to take more time. I know we're all antsy. We're coming into the summertime, but we'll get through it, hopefully, hopefully sooner rather than later. But y'all take care, and we'll talk to you again another time. Thanks a lot.